Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE pod, episode nine. I think it's episode nine, we're in uh, top 10, first 10 out of the gate, Dave. I'm Sean Furrier, Dave Vellante. This is the Cube Pod. We can break down what we're talking about. We're actually on location in San Francisco for RSA. It's the biggest security conference in the world. Uh, we're doing our taping for our pod here, Dave. A lot of stuff going on. We saw a media implosion last week. Now we're seeing it go to the broadcast level. Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon. Events are back. This event is more packed than ever before. The week before the Cube was at, in Europe, KubeCon, 10,000 people. And we're going to have a guest here on this pod coming in as our interview with John Chambers, former CEO of Cisco, now doing a lot of angel investments with his own money that he's made. He's made billions at Cisco. Legend in the industry is going to come in and weigh in and talk with us. Uh, here on theCUBE pod, and we're going to bring him in, but Dave, you know, the, the trends continue, and actually no Elon Musk really to talk about today, <laughs> other than, you know. Quiet week for Elon. <laughs> it's a quiet week <laughs> for Elon. Um, but I'm psyched to have John Chambers come on. We're going to start bringing in guests again. This is our 10th episode, I'm going to go to the ninth episode. We have one more, kind of in our beta run. Yeah, so, well, first of all, RSA is unbelievable, uh, like 40, 50,000 people. I think you nailed it, John. Just, what, what you call it? The, the platformatization, platformatization of, of the security business, which is right on. I mean, everybody's trying to consolidate. You know, they're trying to figure out how to simplify. You know, on a, it, the, we see some companies with 400 tools, and it's just too many. And so you see big companies like Palo Alto and CrowdStrike and others trying to, like Cisco, kind of consolidate. I think you nailed that, platforms over products, but it's hard, right? It's hard to have best of breed products and a platform at the same time. So I think your yeah. analysis. Yeah, and I just got right my up. invite from a friend, influencer uh, for the Blue Sky social network from from uh, Jack Dorsey. We got some antitrust stuff. Microsoft, Brad Smith, Waze, CMA. Speaking of influencer, you're like the number two cloud influencer. I just saw. I just saw, <laughs> that report came out. Again, apparently, you know, it's always these lists. <laughs> well, you know how they do those. Well, first things of all, like I should be number one. That's for <laughs> sure. They got it wrong. Number one is where I should be, Dave. You know that. Number yeah, two, is, you weren't on the list. What happened? I don't know, maybe they think I'm an analyst, <laughs> uh, hard to say. Not an uh, no, the lists, the lists are always kind of like all about social media, but I think, you know, in the word influence, I think we're going to see a, we should have a rant section on influence because I think in the B2B and Sarbjeet Joao wasn't even on the list. I think he's one of the top influencers no in the cloud. No doubt, Corey Quinn was way down on the list, he should have been higher up. I mean, but it, influence is changing and reputation changes, what you influence, I'm a journalist, we're, you're an analyst, so we'll get into that in the rant Stu's section. Stu's on the list. Stu Miniman, yeah, the, yeah. Q, the, the, the pull. That's a pull forward from the Q mojo, going on at Red Hat. Like, yeah, I wonder if Stu, Stu, you think he would've been on the list without the cube? <laughs> I mean, come on, be honest. <laughs> yeah, but I'd love to see that you carried it through with Red Hat. So I wonder if Stu job. got his blue check mark. <laughs> Renewed. I, he, I, you know, that's we, should, we should check in on I Stu wonder, on because that. people, like a lot of people who, you know, kind of got it from Twitter, you know, are shunning, you know, paying for it. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't see a problem. Well, the other thing that's in it. the news we're going to get into, I first I want to get into this whole Fox thing, I think, and, and the Don Lemon with CNN, because that's the implosion of mainstream media. We saw journalism, uh, we, we report on our pod last week, we talked about that, but the big looming story here under the current this week is the layoffs continue. Amazon just had another riff, just came out on Twitter, he had, the news announcer just came out, CNBC carried it, we're going to carry it on SiliconANGLE. Dropbox CEO is laying 16% of its staff off. This is Gen 1 cloud, Dropbox is like Gen 1. Again, I wrote the story uh, with Adam Selesky about next gen cloud coming and we're talking about that here. Dave, this is like a sign. Those, those first gen SaaS companies like Dropbox laying people off is not good. That's not a good sign. Well, so we'll, we'll get into that. I know what you think about that. Well, tech obviously is the, the harbinger, right? Tech started with the layoffs, but you saw the, the GDP results, the, the economy grew 1.1% this past quarter, which was lower than people thought. It's still, I mean, if you if you annualize that, you're still talking about 4.4% growth, and pre-pandemic it was growing just over 2%, so, but nonetheless, the Fed's tightening is doing its job. It's slowing down the economy, you combine that with the bank failures, and you know, we're starting to see a, a suppression, and then if the, you're seeing earnings are actually really good. Meta, we might talk about yeah. that, had really good earnings, and Apple's generally speaking, earnings are out. Generally speaking, earnings are, are better than people expected, or as good or better, I'd say 80% plus are better than expected. Well, you've so always said the rich are getting richer. I mean, Meta, big company. Amazon, probably with all the layoffs, will probably be tuning their numbers. I expect Google had good profits. Google Cloud profitable for the first time. That would hit the wire today. So that's interesting news. Google looking good with cloud. They were kind of turning the knobs. Yeah. So you know that, that's a milestone. Not sure if that's relevant to the CapEx well, scale. You know, actually, I think as I dig into it, I think it, interestingly enough, it was the software side of their business that I think outperformed Google Cloud Platform, which is kind of, kind of cool. But you know what it is, John? These big companies, they have a lot of fat and so they can dial down that fat in bad times and they can, it drops right to the bottom line. Yeah. It just, I think it does speak to, you know, Frank Slootman talks about this in his book and he talked about it when we spoke last year on theCUBE. He's like, look, we don't invest in things that aren't yeah. critical, period. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. we really circumspect about that. So I do think a lot of these bigger companies, they get caught up in the momentum and they start investing 
in things that you know, may not d deliver that sort of yeah. ROI. And, so. and, and for the folks out there laying off DMS, we're connected. We have some openings in our host Cube hosts in areas, we're expanding in different verticals, we have publication, journalism, we have a ton of people in our network that are hiring, certainly on the data side, cloud side, so uh, DM us if you got people, if you know, if you're looking or you know someone who's impacted by the layoffs, hit us up, we got a big network, and we should open up a page, Dave, for the Cube to do a, a job, job kind of matchmaking for the courtesy of the community. Again, we have access to all the top companies, we'll tell you who's hiring, who's not, so give us a ping. Yeah, so, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of talent out there right now. I think, yeah. you know, again, if you get laid off and you're a like, rock star engineer and you get laid off from whatever, Meta or Amazon or Google, whomever, you know, it may be a good time to start a company. I mean, it's, I if mean, you're this, young. If you, uh, this is the best time to do a company. Get laid off, say sayonara, bye-bye, come out, get your friends together, get in the garage, I, I, and I, put a startup together. I mean, you get, teams are being laid off. I see engineering teams. I mean, you cut. said you said in a couple of pods back that you wish you were 25 again, right? So think yeah. about it. Let, let's say you're. I mean, the best <laughs> time to do it, well, really. I mean, startups are risky, but so if you if you're not married, you don't have kids, right? You don't need to sleep, right? You could do a startup. I mean, you know, go and. It's so much know, easier to do a startup right now than when when I was 25, because you can get in and get product market fit. And this is what I was talking with John Chambers about when we're going to hear hear that come out. But basically, the bottom line is is that you know you got more product market fit knobs to turn. It's easier to get the product market fit than ever before. By the way, product market fit is hard as hell to get done. When you're hearing, you're hearing entrepreneurs, even Jeremy Bird, who's a seasoned executive on the board of Snowflake doing a startup four years, he's like, you know, product market fit is the hardest thing he's ever done in his career. That is a testament to how hard entrepreneurship and being a founder is. And now with AI, you can get two or three friends together or colleagues that, that have complementary skills and get out there and actually get a position and take down a position in a, mar a growing market easily. And now you use AI, you use Midjourney for graphics. I mean, you could be up and running literally in, in three weeks. I mean, if, if you're technically savvy and or you have a vision of the market and understand sort of customer problems, I, you know, go out, try to do the analysis of the market, and then look, do whatever you have to do. Raise some capital, friends and family, your move into your parents' basement, whatever, cut your cost, and you raise a couple of hundred thousand dollars just to, just to be able to get to a point where you can understand the market, maybe develop an MVP. You can develop it, how yeah. long does it take how long historically, John, does it take to develop an MVP? And what do you think with generative AI you can do today? I just said three weeks, I think is the yeah. number. But here's what, here's what I would say. You know, we're historians, we're hiring. But what did it take historically? I mean, it depends what era you in. The early era, pre-cloud, you had to get a, you get a, buy a server, which Yeah, is but like let's a, say cloud. Okay, let's it's cloud. cloud. Well, I mean, like Twitter got lucky right out of the gate, and that, that product market fit kind of hit, and then they could never change the product, and they tried many times to make the product better. Elon's doing that, that's why he's got a lot of backlash. I remember when Facebook had product market fit, I mean, people went nuts when the newsfeed was changed for the better, and it was always a revolt. Anytime Facebook did something, but they had product market fit out of the gate, those are the exceptions. You really got to do the work and work backwards from the company. If you're an enterprise custom, enterprise venture, it's really hard. You got to go out and identify problems, got to be a growing market, but once you identify the growing market, you can get Get that problem space you can nail down. You can engine the solution, work backwards. Once you know that, that North Star and that beachhead position, you can accelerate that with the tools out there now and do it in weeks. Yeah, so and then okay, show, so go to the customer and then iterate back. That's a cloud concept and that's phenomenal. So go raise, literally, go raise 50 or 100 grand from your friends, maybe some seed money or whatever, and just, just crank and get yeah. you an MVP and then you know you do a startup. I mean, you know what? If it fails, you're young. Well, Cribble okay. was a great example of a company that kind of did professional services. They didn't even raise money initially. I believe they did some professional services. Then got traction with their pedigree and their technology knowledge, and then someone said, wow, you've got traction. You're actually talking to CISOs and CIOs? Great, here's some cash. That's the seed kicks in. So I'm a big believer in do some consulting with the customers you're targeting, help them in these growing markets where it's shifting, and then you can get that base position. Then you get the seed funding and say, hey, I got engaged customers, boom, done. I funded three maybe even arguably four companies that way. Basically doing kind of a, a cell design build, you get customers to fund an idea, and then you get some cash flow going and then you build up a little base and then you know the hardest part then is to take that, how do you take that, put it into software and scale it, right? Well this is the thing about the security industry, we're here at RSA that I was saying yes about the platformization of, of security. If you go back and look at the startup history in the old days, you had to get a data center, buy a server, go get an internet connection, get a router, CSU, DSU, get on the internet and then you're up, that's basically start coding. That was like a tax of like fifty dollars to $100,000 just to get it going. So you had to do a PowerPoint, convince someone for cash, and a lot of people died, and died trying to do that. Then cloud came out, you put your credit card down, you get up and running, you're off to the races. And that would take months uh, to get traction. Now it's literally, I got cloud, I got product market fit in the tools to get the validation. 
That's the key, and I think you're seeing that in the security now where the security market has been that big bloated, slow, a lot of failure, um, hard to unwind positions if you have a point solution, and this platformization becomes more of a foundational element so that the companies like CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, um, Zscaler, Cisco, Juniper, well, they can be more nimbler. So they can actually go out and deploy point solutions, and this is what the Palo Alto network CPO said, I can do best in breed in certain point cases, and then have that be a platform feature. So he gets best of both worlds. That is like, I think why this, I'm, I'm so pumped about the platformization of security, because it change, changes the game. And uh, the fact that the, no one has dominant market share means, you know, it's going to be a race to that position of who can be that platform. CrowdStrike has a lot of traction. Palo Alto's got a nice platform look. It's going to be interesting to see CrowdStrike and, and Palo Alto go at it, because I think, and I think those Cisco, are the two top ones in my mind. And I think Cisco's interesting because Cisco's so large and it's coming at it from network. I mean, you know networking. You and Zeus were talking about this yesterday. Networking and security, you know, sort of coming together. C Cisco obviously huge in, in networking. They've purchased a lot of security. They got G2 Patel running it. And they just hired Tom Gillis out of VMware. So that's really interesting to me that they can have somebody who really understands that market and can put it together. They've certainly got M&A chops. So Cisco's definitely a player there. They just got a lot of, you know, kind of legacy products that they've cobbled together and got to do a better job of integration. And then the other one's Microsoft, right? Microsoft's Probably the, I mean arguably, and I don't even think it's an argument anymore, the largest security vendor out there just because it's Microsoft. And then you got the other end of this, so Microsoft charges for its security, they compete with CrowdStrike, they compete with Okta and Identity. And then you got the other end of the spectrum is yeah. Amazon Web Services. They just, for the most part, you're not paying them, they're just security's like there, it's embedded. Yeah. You know, Nitro Enclaves, which we're going to be talking about you know, later. I later think on. Microsoft has got a great opportunity ahead of them. The problem with Microsoft is that they keep things so insular, but they got Charlie Bell over there, Sean Bice, they have that team, they got an Amazonian team coming over there, they have huge market share, they have great market lift into their, into their, into their existing customer base. Like AWS, they're perfectly positioned. The question is, is going to be execution. You got Amazon Web Services laying off people, so they got bloodshed going on inside the company, Dave, and Microsoft doesn't. Microsoft's got growth, they got a tailwind. Now granted, I think Amazon's got a superior product on the cloud side, but Microsoft is banging away hard, and you're going to see probably some really good moves. And the question is, will that be the monolithic model for security, or will Microsoft enable the ecosystem to coexist? We heard that all day here. Uh, the first two days here. It's, at, it's uh, interesting, I mean, you know, the, the best product doesn't always win, as you know, but it's different today, right? Amazon, I would agree, is the best infrastructure as a service, and certainly the best building blocks. You know, I, I think, I, I'd have to say, John, I think Azure <clears throat> has the best software apps cloud. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? That it, in other words, if you're a Microsoft customer, it's the easiest place to go. And well, running, maybe best yeah. is a stretch, but I would say the most uh, consumable. Most they've, consumable they've moved and office easiest, over. easiest. And, and Google and, too, oh, Google. And, and, and lowest cost to, 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 to onboard. The thing about Google, and by the way, it's, it's workspace business was doing better, did better this last quarter, but it still has nowhere near the market presence of Of, of course, Microsoft. Microsoft had that monopoly going forward. I mean, so they, they, Google's yeah, business me, is search. I mean, it's like fr yeah, free search. I, I mean, that's I, mean I, think that's that, I think the workspace stuff's got a lot of legs there. It I does, think, I mean, we I use think, it and yeah. it's good. I mean, I, we like I mean, it. a lot of people complain about Teams and some of the things that Microsoft has. Obviously, Word and Office Suite is obviously bread and butter. A Windows franchise all tied in on 365. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense that Microsoft's winning. But it's just we'll so, see when their earnings come out. It's just so I mean, you know. ubiquitous in corporate America, right? I mean, yeah, Teams and 365 and, Well, you know, you look, know. we should do a survey on the, on the makeup of the younger startups coming up. Who's actually on Microsoft, who's not? Well, I mean, that's a good point. You know, I see a lot of startups on our own. Google Gmail, they grew up on, on the managed service. We'll see. Yeah, well, no, the earnings right, are coming out, Dave, so we got, that's one of our, our stories here. We'll get to the Tucker Carlson news and the Don Lemon um, implosion that got fired or whatever that happened there, but you know, real quick, earnings are coming out, events are back, you're seeing, you're seeing uh, the face-to-face -face events, is, that's the biggest news I think that's the most, most awesome from a, from a personal standpoint, and seeing people engaging. Digital still rocking, seeing that as a first party citizen to d events, but earnings are coming out for the big three. All the top tech companies are uh, be launching earnings. We, we your take. Well, well, first of all, on the events, we called this. I mean, you and I, I mean, we, when we did our year in predictions post, I, I called you up and said, John, you know, we're, let's talk about events. And you said, you nailed it. You said, look, Dave, here's, this, here's what's going on. There's gonna, there is 2023, more events, more physical events, they're just going to be smaller in size. There will be some very large, like RSA, MWC, uh, 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 CES, that are very, very large and growing. AWS, Snowflake, okay, that's true. But for the most part, it's going to be larger, 
more, uh, sorry, smaller, more regional events and more of them. Yeah. That's exactly what's happened. Yeah, we got that right. right, as we do a lot of things, so, you know, yeah. we're good. So we earnings, guess. you know, Microsoft obviously had really good earnings. The stock was up, you know, nicely yesterday. Uh, Meta came out, it's up, you know, 13, 14% today, uh, basically on cost cutting, but also revenue growth. And Google, you know, Google did okay, uh, but, but GCP, so here's the deal, I, you know, I focus on the cloud piece of it. I, I think I nailed accurately 30% growth in Azure. I think it came in 31% constant currency. Uh, GCP, yeah. hard to tell, I got them at around 20, 22%. And then AWS, I'm, I'm forecasting 15% for tonight, yeah. you know, after the earnings, just, you know, that'll be Thursday, the earnings come out. Um, but here's the, here's the rundown for the quarter. I got AWS at 21 billion, Azure, and this is just IaaS, at 17 billion, and GCP at three and a half billion. Okay, so you can see, Couple things going on. Microsoft's growth is slowing. Azure is gaining share, unquestionably. So those two are coming together, and you know GCP is far behind with growth rates that you know should be a lot higher at this point in its career uh, now in its, in its uh, maturity. The other thing I'm hearing, John, no question, and I think Amazon's been working hard at this for a while. This is not a new thing. I think it's been going on for a year. They saw this coming, they saw the slowdown coming, they saw the consumption trends, and they went out and tried to get customers, and they're active about this, to try to lock them into longer term agreements. Hey, we can save you money if you sign yeah. up for more, and the customer's like, it's hey. It's a smart move. We're, it's a smart move. We're using AWS anyway, yeah. why not sign up yeah. for more? We're not going to leave these guys. There's no churn, very very little churn in the AWS uh, uh, IS space, very little. And we're yeah. talking low uh, single I, digits. I think that so why wouldn't you just lock in a better deal? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a smart move. The other two things I'm seeing that's involving the cloud earnings is going to be, or their position is one, um, the competition positioning between AWS and Microsoft. I think Google's going to have an opportunity to get catch back up and, and they're going to level up. Also, the pol political angle, White House is here at, the, at this show for cybersecurity. You start to see policy. We'll hear from John Chambers when he comes on about the role of tech companies in aligning with politics. A global scale tech and politics are now have to be aligned because it's just tech is involved in all of our life. But, Dave, this is something that I've been seeing lately and I want to get your thoughts on it because it's my observation. Microsoft and Amazon's competitive strategy and war against each other is playing out in a really weird way. Microsoft's trying to be Amazon from a cloud standpoint, capabilities, because Amazon's way ahead, technically. And Amazon's trying to be Microsoft to be like, we know how to do the enterprise. And it's interesting, it's, I, I see Amazon Web Services trying too hard to be like Microsoft. And when they're already ahead, so I've never seen a, a leader try to be, change their strategy for, to compete and align with the second player in the market. I've never seen that in the history of my life. Say, I'm number one, I want to play more like number two. Like, I've never seen that. And I think Amazon should stay to their strengths, not try to be Microsoft. I've been in meetings where it's like, well, we have to have a story against Microsoft. Why would they even be distracted from Microsoft? So, so I think they're different companies. Microsoft will win the enterprise sales install base game because they have it. Amazon's gaining it, they're getting the new market share, and they're just trying too hard to be like an enterprise company. When well, I I, what's I, your take I, on that? I'd say a couple of points I'd make on that, and I think the, while I agree, what we're talking about with the enterprise, I don't see Amazon trying to be like Microsoft in this sense, and you, Jerry Chen, and I have talked about this. I think it's Amazon strategy, as you well know. Here's the building blocks, go build SaaS <coughs> products that compete with Microsoft. Same thing with their generative AI, their large language model announcement. It's like, here are the Lego pieces. We're not going to try to be open AI and Microsoft and Bing. We're going to let you go yeah. build that and compete with them. And oh, by the way, we're not going to suck up your IP. You know, presumably, that's their promise. Yeah. So I do see that as different. A lot of people had suspected you know, five, six, seven years ago that uh, Amazon was going to try to go up market and build more SaaS applications. While they have done more solutions, like they've done in call centers and the like, they are not competing against Microsoft trying to be them in software, in the application software. So that's different in productivity software. They're enabling their customers and their, their, their community, their ecosystem, to build that to compete. Now, to your point, right? They did yeah. overhire a lot of people. They probably hired old enterprise folks who yeah. were like, well, know that game. Well, but to your point, remember, it took Amazon a while to figure out how to sell to the enterprise, other than just selling to developers. And I think they're still trying to figure it out. You look at what's happening with Outposts, and it, you know, the Outposts. I'm not sure Outposts is a proxy for Amazon's enterprise sales well, no, strategy. No, no, but I mean, it is in terms of them going after on-prem, and, and, and I think that the challenge They are killing on the partner <clears throat> network, though. Yeah, I but mean. the challenges, before we get to the partner network, the challenges that they've had going on-prem have allowed 
companies like HPE and Dell the time to come up with their as a service offerings like Apex and, uh, and, and GreenLake, which initially were really deficient, but they're getting better. They're actually, they're getting you know, better than Outpost at this point in time. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting equilibrium and a good, good fight that's ensuing. Well, Microsoft's <clears throat> more than Outpost, they got the edge stuff. Anyway, not that, but I think their leadership's No, just Amazon different. you're talking about. Amazon's yeah. got the edge, they have edge products that are coming out. I think they're better and Well, the that's different. That's, I mean, I, I know they more, think about I think, the I think, I don't, I'm not edge. sure it's a false positive, I just get the sense that they're trying to be like Microsoft. We'll, we'll, we'll investigate well, hold this. Hold on, uh, unpack what you just said, because I do think, I think this, so remember Jassy said, well, we just look at the data center as it's another edge. I, I don't agree. The data center is not just another edge. The data center is the data center. And it's, it's a big edge. Right, it's, maybe it's, it's a big edge. It's a fat edge. But it's very much different than you know, some you know, a, a agriculture or oil field drilling thing. It's, it's, it's much different than that kind of IOT. And so I think that's a different discussion. And I think the cloud guys have a really good shot, Amazon in particular, <coughs> at doing really well in areas I think like the data, I think the data center is an industrial edge, <coughs> in my opinion. If it's running cloud operations. Mm, I see the industrial edges as, as you know, in, in industry 4.0, I think it's Yeah, different. factory floor, <laughs> big, big physical plant, um, a sensor on a windmill. Yeah, or but not banks, data centers where they're running mainframes. That's mainframe data centers of yesteryear. And yeah, there's a lot of them. Right? <laughs> there's fewer than there used to be and they're smaller. All right, we're going to have to unpack the Amazon Web Services and the <laughs> Microsoft strategies. I think just just to make one final point, the layoffs at AWS underscore, in my opinion, what I think is what's happened. They hired a lot of, overhired a lot of enterprise folks to try to win the game, get in that game and be more enterprise-like. Not Microsoft-like, but more enterprise-like. But when you hire enterprise people, where do they come from? The classic enterprise. So, so I think Microsoft has that DNA. Amazon's never had that, AWS never had that classic enterprise DNA. It's always the old guard versus the new guard. So, you know, I just think they might have mishired a bunch of enterprise folks, and obviously they're laying off 18,000 people, and just this week, AWS is affected, so you know, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't know yet, but I just hear narratives in the market like, they, they're worried about Microsoft, like, and so I've just never seen a number one player look in the rear view mirror at the competition, it's and change strategies or adjust narratives based upon it, the number two player. It's a little bit Why not go faster? But it's a little bit surprising to me that Jassy seems to be doing the layoffs in like little paper cuts. You know, I think it's, he, he, he probably, I mean, of course he doesn't want to do layoffs, but there've been sort of these waves of layoffs versus sort of, all right, let's get it over with now. And I think it's, I think it's just, it, it underscores the uncertainty that's in the market, even from companies that have you know, great data like Amazon. All right, so let's get into the media implosion of Tucker Carlson out at Fox. He did a full monologue, I just watched it online this morning, um, you know, calling out people, oh, the truth will prevail. He's I mean, the one who was putting I out was the, he say. was putting out the rhetoric that. So explain to people, who may haven't seen it. He put Fox post parted ways with Tucker Carlson, primetime host, okay, because of the Dominion Republic that caught him the night before the trial, text messages that got everyone in a, in a tissy. They settled the thing for three, 787, billion dollars or whatever it was. A million. million dollars is like <laughs> an unbelievable number. Um, just mind-blowing settlement. Uh, and there's more coming, as Brendan pointed out uh, in our RSA uh, show. Um, and so he's out. Don Lemon got dismissed too. And these, these firings were just like, they called their agents and he's gone. They didn't even talk to anyone. So Bill O'Reilly got fired. Um, Fox ditched their people, they don't care. Now I heard that they're trying to lock up Tucker Carlson so he doesn't go anywhere. So a lot of stuff going on, but he was the number one show. And I think Fox News you know, has that reputation of being that, that hardcore. So what you referenced is he put a, a post, a video out on Twitter, basically saying that you know, when, you, when you step away for a little bit, you, you find out you know, who's your really, there's some really nice people out there, I'm sure people reached out to him, and then he said, and he, then he basically said, you know, all these discussions that are going on are really irrelevant and really stupid, they don't matter, you can't get the truth anywhere, and to your point, John, he was the one who was perpetrating these falsehoods, so I don't know what he's talking about, I mean, I thought it was ridiculous what he was saying on Twitter, uh, so I don't know, I mean, he's, uh, the guy to me has just lost all credibility. Now the other thing too is that supposedly the Fox lawyers went to him before the trial and said, hey Tucker, good news. They're going to redact all that, all that stuff that you said, all that misogynistic stuff and that, the, the things that you said about these, your colleagues. And he said, I want them to be exposed. 
you know, so he's like, he's like imploding. It's like <laughs> self implosion here. The guy's losing it. And he had, did, look at, he did say a lot of what our, a lot of people consider, myself included, yeah. some racist things. He said like, oh, that guy got hired because he's black. I mean, he said that. I mean, it's like probably, right? He, <laughs> in, he, he inferred that. I mean, yeah, I mean, that is like not cool, right? I mean, to, they are text to throw messages. that around. They are text messages. They are, you know, they're. Oh, he said that on air. Oh, he, he said, oh, okay. this guy probably got hired because he was black, but that's beside the point. I mean, he said that. I well, Kara Swisher, Kara Swisher had a post today. He's thinking, speculating based on his, he did an underground video um, that looked kind of cheesy um, that he's going to probably have a run at Twitter as a, um, a platform. So, you know, Elon Musk, you know how that's going pretty right wing. Um, and then he says he despises Trump. He said that in one of his texts. He saw, called one of his colleagues the C word. Okay, you know, I mean, he's just, the guy's off the rails. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. That, that, I mean, that's got to be why Fox probably said, get, we're done with this guy. He's got to go. Yeah, I mean, you it know, just goes to show you what goes on on camera and what their real thoughts are, and they're peddling all the, all the networks. That's why nobody trusts mainstream media. That's why it's become so polarized because as a collective tribe and community and society, you got to trust media. And it's, this is a huge issue in, in, in how we've come come about. So we'll, you, you, I hope you this, remember, I mean, I hope this changes for those are young people, you know, so the, so the couple things I'd point out. So 60 Minutes used to have a thing called Point Counterpoint. And there was a, remember the, the, uh, the, the parody on Saturday Night Live. You know, they had one side and the other side, and it was actually really good. And then they, the, the other show was this show called The McLaughlin Group, and basically John McLaughlin, who was a hardcore Republican under, I think he worked in the Nixon administration and others, he would gather people from the left and the right, and they'd put it forth an issue and they would debate it. And you would hear both sides of really smart people debating the issue, and, it, and you would be able to draw your own conclusions with real facts instead of like trying to switch between MSNBC and Fox and where you get you can't get any story it's just so tainted so those, those Tucker is right about that those shows are gone that 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 discourse is gone I don't know how you you get it anymore you know so, Fox News has always had the philosophy to give the so, audience what they want so but Yes, but so what I'd love to see is Don Lemon and, and Tucker Carlson actually, you know, two smart people, start a program and actually invite people in from both sides. But are they have, smart people? Have, have debates. Are they smart people? I do think they're smart people, I do. I, yeah. But, 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 but let them make, see. but let them make their, their smart, let's see how smart they are. Let them make their arguments with somebody else in the room who's smart and can defend the yeah, other but side. Rupert Murdoch, everyone knows, like I said, the, his whole business model is give the people what they want. And then, then he's got no loyalty host. He took out Tucker Carlson, the number one guy, whether you like him or not, he was pulling the numbers in, and he's gone. Because and Bill O'Reilly got can you got um, what's Megan Megan uh, was was cut to. They don't care. It's Fox's. But what's it's, it's about Fox. But what's wrong with people that they don't want to hear both sides of the story? Is that am I like the only person? Yeah. Out there? I know I'm not. There's a big fat middle. And, you know, this is like the the far the f cry from the far middle. That they they want the to. numbers, Dave. But Why do people create salacious headlines for clicks? Okay, why is, I, I, why is journalism okay, not working? Okay, because of clicks. It, it, why uh, aren't okay. things working? Because is, people, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, okay, that's but, the, but the, if the you saying, look, as you know, in, but, in media. But you know and, most and voters. That, that's, that's the answer. But you know most, you okay, know, wait, let me answer. ask you a question. Okay. You know most voters are down the middle. They're independent. Not really. Right? I, I think that's a fact, but yeah, okay. I mean, it's actually pretty wide, but you're making an assumption there. No, I think it's a. I think it's a fact. I think you look up. You look up. You know, independent voters versus Democrats and Republicans. There's more independents now. There's not really. It's fifty-fifty in the last election. No, but it, but yeah, there's <laughs> there's Democrats, there's Republicans, and there's independents. There's more independents than anybody. You look it up. It, it, that's right. But so my question is, wouldn't there be? We're if, in the rant as, section assume now. Assume for a section. Assume for a second that I'm right. Okay, just okay. assume that. If okay. I'm correct, wouldn't there be demand? for a, uh, a show, as I'm describing, where you get people on the left, people on the right, they debate it out and then let the audience come up with their own conclusions. Yeah, it would take leadership from someone in the media organization to, to actually do that and get the numbers Why up. Why don't we do that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think people would tune in, Dave. I don't think we'd pull the numbers in. Why, because I mean, people just want to be in an echo chamber? I mean, what's wrong well, with people I mean, if that's you, the case? Well, we don't have the platform to pull in the big numbers. I mean, think about it. If you're talking about Fox, CNN, yeah, no, okay, like, they're on broadcast, yeah. they have reach. Even CNBC on the business side, they have reach. Reach is a time-based consumption. It's linear, and people will argue linear, it's not like linear TV, but we call it linear TV. At eight o'clock it starts, you have certain programs, it's scheduled, and they have limited time. And so they have to do their best to tell a story in a clock, on a clock. And so digital, our program is a little more deeper, we can go deeper, so I think you'll see digital streaming fill the void, and I think you're going to start to see 
first thing is going to be left and right will put their rhetoric out there, and then hopefully I think if we could emerge a show, great, I'd be all for it. However, it, coming from digital, we'll have lower numbers, but maybe more targeted audience, but you got to be on that broadcast spectrum to have the right show, in my opinion, because the numbers are there and you got to get that mainstream uh, outlet out there. You hear so, a lot of conversation I about mean, MSNBC, in my opinion, should be the one, because they're not Fox and they're not CNN, but they lean to the left, and I would, I would reposition that to be center and go right at the center, like you said, that would be the best. Uh, but I mean, I find Rachel Maddow is as is, is, is biased as Sean Hannity. I mean, you know. Well, that's what I'm saying, you got to change that. Right. But and they so, have numbers. Right, well, okay, but uh, I guess, again, my question is that people just want what they want to hear and be in an echo chamber. I think there's, you hear them, there's no yeah. trust in the media. There's no trust in the media because you never get both sides of the story. That's what journalism is supposed to be. And so I, I, th I my premise okay, is let's, that let's if, get if the pod, let's make the pod, this pod, that show, let's go. All right. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get some people in that can actually intelligently, and we all know people on the left, we all know people on the right. We, we're in text chats together, and then when you actually have a reasonable conversation, you, you come up with a conclusion that's not insane. <laughs> right? <It's, laughs> I find the far left and the far right are all insane. You know, and they don't care, they just want to read headlines. Well, the polarization they, they, has caused massive problems. And then once you have them separate like that, they just stoke their base. And that's one of the problems I see with the whole subscription newsletter model. Once you have an audience that you know you depend on financially, you stay and you got to keep that. And so the so-called biased journalists are actually in a, in a perverse incentive not to be journalists. They're in the paid newsletter business. Okay, so the best journalists are going to newsletters Okay, and this is now on the print side, and there's no incentive to like be aggressive because you don't want to lose people who are paying you. The whole purpose of independence is to not worry about audience churn and just get the truth out there. So again, the incentives is what's going to drive everything. And you know, one thing about corporate influence and advertising yeah. influence is that a lot of these publications on the business model get addicted to the crack, and then once they I mean, get you know addicted, it's over. I mean, and, and that's why some of the clickbait. That's why Buzzfeed went down. That's why the media implosion's happening, because the revenue model is off. I mean, I will say this for like Tucker Carlson, I mean, he did get up there every night, as did Bill O'Reilly, and you know, it's hard to do. I mean, you got to get, you got to bring it every single night, and, and you got to serve to your point, you got to serve the audience. And I would watch Tucker Carlson, you know, quite frequently if I'm not working late, yeah. and, and because I want to hear that side of the story, and then like I said, I'll turn it over to MSNBC and just hear well, what John Rachel Stewart, Maddow, so. John, John Stewart's trying to start to build something on this model, so we'll see. I mean, it's going to take some real, you know, known brands and someone with guts on the leadership side to put down the cabbage, so to speak, to fund an operation. But, but so if you, you put know. Bill Maher and, and Tucker Carlson in the same room and picked an, uh, and I, uh, you know, pardon the interruption, like, you know, issue, and have them debate it out. I mean, two smart, really articulate, I think we should stream that out. I think we should, I think we should like a pay-per-view Are you telling cage me that match. wouldn't get great ratings? Well, I think I it mean, would. I would love to hear it's got, that. Maybe you know? we should do it, do like, a cage oh, match. Oh wow, I didn't realize, oh that's a good argument. Let's hear how Bill, you know, counters that. Oh wow, Tucker, and, and here how Maybe someone should build debate. a social theater, Dave. A digital theater, like a, like a portal. <laughs> All right, You're let's just get the in. guy to do it, John. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, let's get in. We have John Chambers joining us. We're going to, on this pod, we said we would bring in some guests um, as we phase in, uh, close to number 10. Our, our goal has always been 10 podcasts, and then after 10, get a kind of a format down, and the next 10, figure out how to get you know, more of a groove swing. So you know, we're going to go before 10, bring in a guest. We're going to bring in John Chambers. Um, we're going to sit down with him here at RSA where we're doing our live remote and uh, get into a conversation, very interesting conversation right now with John Chambers. A man who needs no introduction, John Chambers is here, friend of theCUBE. Great to see you again, thanks for coming Dave, on. Dave, it's a pleasure, John, to be with Great you again. Great to see you. So John, a, a question that John and I ask a lot of okay. executives like yourself, is security a do-over? Oh, now that's, not the way I've had it framed before, so I'm going to buy a little bit of time to distract your audience if I get my answer <laughs> on it. Um, the answer is yes. I think security of the past uh, isn't going to work. Those were in silos, individual products, very complex, uh, required human intervention, uh, were not simple to use or install, but you didn't understand the benefits and able to quantify where you put your risk. Uh, I think you're going to see security of the future, an architectural play, which thinks about it from where are you versus your peers, if you invest money, where should you invest, how does it lower your cyber insurance or work through it. Uh, 
how do you prevent the attacks once they start to occur and shut them down quickly? How do you recover from them, et cetera? And that whole 360 degrees. So I think you're going to see a next generation of security leaders. Uh, you and I were teasing earlier, John, about a security kind of boring something of the past. Yeah. Yeah. I would argue no, because you're going to see a whole new generation of leaders within it. Yeah. Security is set up for an architectural play, nobody's been able to capitalize on it. And the only way you have security is for to not require human intervention and for the pieces to talk and communicate together. You know this better than I do, when you look at the market, with the exception of Microsoft, they've got a big you know, security business, I guess, it's hard to tell, they're okay. kind of everywhere. <laughs> but no one company has more than you know, single digit market share, right? Now uh, when yes. you were the CEO of, of Cisco, you had, yeah. I think 60 plus percent market share, okay. right? And so, do you think that will change in the future? Uh, I think it has to, and uh, for mainly positive reasons. Uh, one of the things that I was taught early on by Jack Welch at uh, GE is he said, John, if you don't have at least 20% market share, especially in what he understood about technology companies, you don't have staying power. So to have a lot of players you know, in, in a security architecture where nobody has even 10%, uh, you're going to see a consolidation in that, and you're probably going to see a number of new generation leaders. I do think it's set up for one or two or three players to lead in this, and it could be a startup who just gets bigger yeah. and moves into market adjacencies yeah. and use the innovation engine to really go, or it could be one of the existing security players, a CrowdStrike, a Palo Alto Networks, a Cisco, that makes the transition. I'm betting either way, I'll be okay. <laughs> so it could be a company like Rubrix that is just on a tremendous growth range and a very high unicorn approaching double digits yeah. capability who decides to go into multiple other areas, which I'd love to see Bipple do. Mm. Or it could be one of the startups that suddenly really scales dramatically and begins to piece it together, or an existing incumbent who reinvents themselves. Now, the problem with existing incumbents, it's hard to reinvent. You've got to get the next market transition right, that's when you gain share. So the business model on security is now going to be enabled by AI, and it's going to be enabled around simplicity, ease of use, how you purchase your stuff. And security has to be built in from the very beginning, it can't be an afterthought. You overlay security on an electrical grid, all you're doing is putting band-aids on it. It has to be designed for the beginning of how you do it. Same thing with networking with a company yeah. called Now, which Pankaj yeah. Patel is re leading. Uh, it's designed ease of use, it reduces yeah. dramatically your operational cost, mm -hmm. and it was designed for simplicity <laughs> from the very beginning with zero trust yeah. built in from the very beginning. So until you get that in supply chain, until you get it in the electrical grid, until you get it in the networks, you really don't have security of today. So there's going to be a new player yeah. here. I'd love to be a part of that. I'd love for him to buy my company, so I'd love <laughs> for one well. of my companies to be that, that mover. And John, you're it. investing a lot, as you mentioned earlier, which is great. And you, you've seen the market moves. We're in a market now that are many people saying, look, it's a shift. It's not on like a market, well, you buy some companies, some white space, product roadmap, fill that in, buy it, integrate it in. This is a market where there's opportunity for revolutionaries to take big positions. New companies, startups coming in, and um, as my friend Jim Anderson, a, a VC, an old, old school VC said, some of the startups are, are ideas that no one gets or sees. Yes. It looks different. Yes. Is there, is there uh, something that you see out there that, that, you oh. might, be, that might be different? Because we don't, it's not a follow the herd mentality. I guess AI, they got yeah. that going on hype yeah. right now, but in these big movement, when these big market yeah. step functions, where yeah. there's a change of the guard, yes. there's always that company that no one gets. Yeah. Could be a little company, two guys out of Stanford, build a box to connect networks together, could be Airbnb type, no one, yeah. what is this company? What is that in your mind? These okay, new, yeah, a new. series of questions on it. Uh, first, I'll start with a way out there approach. You all remember I said voice would be free mm -hmm. and it destroyed mm -hmm. the, uh, my service provider customers were pretty upset with me saying that to <laughs> enjoy their revenues and their profits. But it was obvious it would be because it was such a small load on the internet that companies would give it away to get the data and get the video side. One that's unknown that I think is going to change dramatically and it's counterintuitive because of the deep fakes going on, especially with artificial intelligence, is the voice. You're going to be able to imitate Dave or John and yeah. you, I won't be able to tell it's not you. Mm -hmm. However, if you really look at voice, it is broken up in a single second to 8,000 samples. And in five seconds, 40,000 samples can't be spooked. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, you're going to be able to see a company like a pin drop be able to say in voice, it may be the single ID sign-on. 
and wouldn't it be so nice starting your car or logging into uh, a call center uh, or the ability to get on an yeah. airplane where you're able to just say a couple of sentences and they get it. And before you say, well, John, that does work because of the AI capability and deep fakes, it's the reverse. Yeah. You'll be able to say very quickly, this was Dave. You'll be able to say, no, it was not and it was another human, or you'd be able to say, no, this was uh, engine machine driven, and the machines actually get a signature that you're able to associate with it. Yeah. So that's a way out there type of move. The second thing is that you're going to have a player like a small company, like a safe, that starts out of India and is growing at about 200% per year just on ranking architecture for uh, how secure are you, where do you put your investments, yeah. et cetera, and then they have the courage to do yeah. cyber insurance tied to that, yeah, yeah. which gets a 360 going. Small company, a couple hundred million in evaluation, just did a major finance run for, if you can imagine, $52 billion, million dollars, yeah. uh, and they had seven term sheets. Clearly, that's something nobody's seen in the yeah. market. Uh, or you could have a now that rethinks networking with security, and they'll be doing a fundraise very, very shortly, and I think that will go extremely well as well. Maybe a way out player, you think of a Rubrics as a, uh, a storage system and backup, well they're now a security system yeah and the best form of defense against ransomware there is. They kind of pivoted. They can move scary. in, they pivoted, yeah, they yeah. reinvented themselves. So those are the type of things, but I think yeah. it's most likely be players that weren't on people's radar screens two years yeah. ago. You're nice in giving me credit for AI saying two years ago it was going to cross the chasm. I said it six years ago, <laughs> a little bit early. Yeah. But to me, AI is going to be bigger than uh, the cloud and bigger than the internet combined. And I bet six years ago on AI companies, say ASAP or yeah, yeah. a Unifor or a Spark Cognition uh, or a Sprinkler. And so I think those are the exciting moves today that will create the next generation of You started investing business. in AI six years ago? Six years ago. Uh, what, I made so, five, majors, five major investments. So what time. did you see at the time and what's different now? Well, what I saw at the time was that I felt it would be the next cloud and the next internet, both yeah. of which I did a pretty good job of seeing around the corners and then betting not just saying yeah. here's what it was happening, but betting with it. And you could see customers, the really leading edge customers grasp the change here. And I saw yeah. how AI could completely change the customer experience for companies and their call centers. And that would be yeah. the first application, much like the internet's first application could be as simple as entering orders online. Mm -hmm. And once you see that, you begin to connect the dots and the balance. And then everything I saw continued to build upon it. And so it's it's classic. I'm What's around the customers. corner now in your mind? Because you got data, you got AI, clear path there. I can see yeah. that. What's around the corner that 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 you're looking at now? That you're you're connecting the dots on. Well, two things. First of all, I think you articulated very well who the winners are going to be in AI in part. It's about compute. Then it's about the data, and the companies aren't going to give up their data. It's nice to have a chat GPT uh, out there for the internet, but there's no way a given company, especially a security company or enterprise company, is going to give access to their data to others. So it's the ability to really yeah. think about how do you use the data in an effective way, and then how do you do the logarithms, the AI piece of it, to really change things. So I think you're going to see a gold rush here. I think some of these companies, unfortunately, will get overvalued again. Our memory is remarkably short, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like two months. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, to suddenly wake yeah. up and say, well, I'm going to bet on the new player who's just starting with a new yeah. idea. If you didn't bet five and six and seven years ago, yeah. you're probably not going to be a player here long term. So it's going to be fun yeah. to watch how it shakes out. What's just around the corner? If somebody could get AI and cybersecurity together uniquely, yeah. that gets exciting. But every company's going to be an AI company. Yeah, yeah. Every company's going to be digital. That means tech's here to stay, and the future looks very good. Question is, can the U.S. lead in this or not? Well, good question. I mean, what's your investment philosophy right now in terms of growth capital versus sort of early stage? How do you think about that? <laughs> well, I'm a little bit, uh, uh, over the board more than I'd like to be. I originally would say I'm a B-level B investor. Right. Once it gets up to C, D, E series, it's out of my pocketbook. Yeah. I invest all my funds myself with my, my uh, four partners together. Uh, I uh, today would actually say I'm investing earlier. I like the seed in yeah. series A because I can grow them and I've seen the movies and I can pick the mix that I want. I can also pick diversity in the leaders. Three out of the last five companies I've added are headed up by female CEOs, which I think we need to do a much better job mm -hmm. of as an industry, yeah. especially the VCs. But my ideal target is a company that has a run rate of about two million that I know I can help them grow to 10, to 50, to 100. 
And so my goal is really not an investor, I'm more of a strategic coach, a partner, yeah. uh, an advisor, and a, a, a you know, somebody who's kind of there to listen on the tough Well, you got a, obviously you got the pedigree, and you're doing great work, and you're in the trenches. You mentioned competitive to USA, I want to get your thoughts on, sure. a lot of young people I've been talking to, they're looking at our society and they go, you know, there's a lot of change going on, there's a lot of fears, there's a lot of recession, what's the future look like, global economy? What's the best way we can be more competitive as a country on the global stage, as intellectual property yeah. rights are being viewed, you mentioned people aren't going to give us their data, that's, yeah. some are saying, we're saying on the yeah. cube, that's the new IP. Yeah. Be the AI, work with AI, but as uh -huh. a country, how do we, what's, What's the, what's the positive outlook and what are some well, steps we can let's take? Let's start with the challenges. Uh, there is no entitlement. You have to earn the position and Silicon Valley doesn't have that nor does the US, you have to earn it. We need a higher sense of urgency. However, we control our destiny more than anyone else. And so our destiny on the number of unicorns, what is it, 1,667, <laughs> probably a third aren't going to be unicorns a year from now, maybe yeah. half, but the number coming in, we grew last year at about 12%. China only grew three, four percent. India grew 22 percent. In fact, if you look at what is occurring in India, they had more unicorns created than China did. So a changing of the guard, perhaps in emerging markets, is very possible in terms of the direction. Uh, so I think it's all about this country being the best startup country, not just in Austin and Boston and uh, Atlanta and Silicon Valley, but in all 50 states. That's what I'm doing in my home state of West Virginia. You're going to say West Virginia, startup <laughs> state? Guess what was the number three startup state in the nation this last year? Really? <laughs> West Virginia, 90% growth in startups, industry average 27. Guess what state has the lowest unemployment in its history ever keeping in fact, West Virginia. Really? Guess Sounds like state. someone's been doing jo some work there. Joe Manchin yeah. for president there? Yeah, Joe it, Manchin's yeah. quite I a person. You, Shelley Moore Capito is very yeah. good as okay. well. <laughs> a lot of good players. But what I'm saying is we took control of the state, changed the education, made it inclusive, got Democrats and Republicans. Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican. Joe Manchin, a Democrat. The governor, Republican. Mm -hmm. Speaker of the House, President of the Senate. Common vision. And we did things that people thought couldn't be done, and we moved from yeah. 45, 48 in every category to three, number six in GDP growth tied yeah. with Oregon. I mean, we're playing the, at a different level. What's the infrastructure there? I'm sure there's got to be great connectivity. Connectivity, internet access. The infrastructure is actually the people. Yeah. We had a common view. It's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit, and people worked at a common vision and put aside their differences. I think the common infrastructure here is West Virginia's, yeah. we're yeah. basically very good people. Yeah. Uh, we care about winning together. Uh, we try to do the right thing, and we had the courage to dream. We were the chemical center of the world, the coal mining center of the world, yeah, when I well. grew up. We perhaps have a chance to do it again, but it isn't West Virginia. We need to do that it's in all formula. 50 states. It's a formula. That's what I'm doing in France with Macron, is the, uh, his key global ambassador for high tech. And in India with uh, Modi, he calls me his global ambassador, <laughs> but I'm really the uh, head Great of US-India Strategic Partnership Forum. Yeah. Probably the most strategic relationship in the world to the US at the present time. Where are you on public policy right now? I, mean, I presume you don't want to pause investment in, in AI. Uh, you're seeing, you know, FTC wants to break up big tech. We saw, we saw today Activision, the, the, the UK government is blocking, and I'm yeah. sure the you know, US is not far behind. We, kind of stop the NVIDIA arm acquisition. Where, where do you think we are? It feels like the pendulum's swinging. Are you comfortable with that? Would you like to see a, a better public-private partnership? Well, I think there has to be a better public-private partnership. Let me be critical of my industry for a moment. Uh, during the 90s and the first decade of 2000s, we were a leader in the industry and the internet in a big way, and our peers and competitors were very good. We had no major issues in the European Union or in China mm. or in the US or others. But we always were able to say what is the public policy goal that's fair and how do we work together as opposed to giving the Heisman move and stiff arm. Mm -hmm. uh, the big tech companies, uh, they brought this on themselves. Uh, and they didn't work with government for legitimate needs. And you have to have, in my opinion, and that isn't all of them, but several of them did. You have to have a clear economic path, but you also owe an obligation to society. If you don't do both, on issues of privacy, fairness, et cetera, you're going to be regulated, and then antitrust will follow. Mm -hmm. Both the Democrats and Republicans told us this was coming. We didn't listen very well. So I think this is one where I think it's time for a gut check yeah, on yeah. terms of is yeah. high tech good for America? 
Yeah. My group at Cisco, 92% of Americans felt it was good. Yeah. Today, majority of Americans think it's not good. We have to re the public confidence. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, you're going to see activities that come within it. Now to your question about AI and uh, do we need a pause, a lot of smart people said this, I don't know what they were thinking. The horse isn't out of the barn. Mm. Every horse in the world is out of the barn and in other countries. <laughs> uh, out of my 20 startups, 19 are AI companies today. Uh, pause is not an, not an option. That is so deeply inbred, it is the future of defense, it's the future of these companies, it's productivity. Yeah. You'd crash the system if you even tried to do this and it's not doable. So I think there is one where people have a legitimate concern. And the legitimate concern is we need guide rails and we need them quickly. But a pause was a non-starter non -starter. from the beginning, and I don't, I, I don't understand why people th even thought that was a viable option. Yeah, I, I agree. I so they even catch very up. few political leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're another country and want to catch up, mm, yeah. uh, or if you're an existing incumbent that doesn't have a good strategy in AI, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. But this is one. It, it, you know, disruption waits for no one. Yeah. So we better lead, and we better get the right guide rails. Well, the high, do, the high think it's, do you think it's US one, the rest of the world zero right now? Or oh, no, are, are we, are I think we, this is uh, a a jump ball, <laughs> uh, okay. and Great let's game. use cybersecurity as an example. Are 80% uh, of the unicorns in cybersecurity in the US? Yes. Do we have a good chance to play this one well? Yes. Will we play it well enough? I don't know. Uh, on AI, it's much more of a jump ball. There's a lot of technology going on around the world in this area, including deep fakes, yeah. uh, road country espionage, Mis et cetera. Misinformation, disinformation. Yeah. yeah, if you look at it, you know, use China as an example, and I believe in the long run, U.S. and China should learn to work together, and I think that will eventually come back. But in the short run, it's clearly going to be extremely bumpy uh, in terms of the direction. And you have to have intellectual property protection per your comments. You have to have the capability uh, to say, if the U.S. is going to lead in defense, we better lead in AI and cybersecurity as we move forward. Yeah. And at the present time, even using the U.S. Defense Department slash reports that I saw, China leads the U.S. in probably 15 of the 20 most important areas. Two, we can't lose AI and cybersecurity. John, you always bring the energy and the okay. insight. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. again on theCUBE. Yeah, John and John. I really <laughs> enjoy our time with you. John, thank, thank, you. thank you, John, appreciate it. Okay, John Chambers here, Dave on the pod. That's awesome, I mean here at RSA, great to have his time. Our first guest, big name John Chambers, former uh, CEO of Cisco Systems, who Architected probably one of the best M&A runs of all time. Cisco Systems was a, a just a startup connecting you know networks together and then buildings for companies and then you know TCP/IP, OSI, open source, open systems interconnect happened. That became the interconnecting revolution. Client server, the rest became one of the most valuable companies in the history of the world. They started buying companies, and um, you know that's a lot going on here at RSA. We're going to see a lot of that in cloud. Can the M&A formula work? Is there a new kind of formula? I thought that was an interesting take on him, but what struck me most about John Chambers is he's such a great orator, he's a great communicator, and he's so passionate about the U.S. competitiveness. And, and you know, we rant a lot about the U.S. and you know, laws and, and in the Linacon and what we think the government should be doing. We're just ranting about media. Um, but he's focused, and, and I think his position is very strong. Let's get leaders, and let's get the tech industry not to bury their head in the sand and give the Heisman, as he said, to the, to the government. Technology is represented in every single consumer's life right now. And so it's not that corner industry, cottage industry, the VC's industry, little, it's, it's an asset class now in the venture capitalists and private equity, but technology's in all of our lives. Uber, iPhone, you name it, you name the tech, it's infiltrated our society, and with that comes responsibility. He's calling that out. That to me was the big moment uh, in that in that podcast, other than the great you know uh, re revitalization he's doing in West Virginia, I think Middle America is going to be booming. I think with entrepreneurship as we get connected more, but he's on that right there. But this whole competitiveness thing is really interesting to me. Yeah, he's such a gentleman. He's got that smooth Southern accent, and he's really inspiring. And he always brings the energy, John, <laughs> when he comes and meets with us. So. You know, the, the thing he said, which was interesting, is that the, the big tech backlash was largely self-inflicted. I'm not sure I totally agree with that, only because the history of the U.S. government's intervention in big tech has been quite abysmal. You know, they broke up AT&T and made the U.S. telecommunications industry less competitive. You know, they, they were after IBM for the, a decade plus, and IBM ended up, you know, self-imploding. 
Same thing with Microsoft, they missed the, you know, mobile, they missed the, 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 the internet, they missed cloud for a long time until Satya, Satya came in. So generally speaking, I think big tech is, is, is going to, and tech companies in general, are going to mess up themselves. They don't need the US government to do that. Now having said that, things have changed, and, and, and he's probably right, he, that the, the big tech probably should have gone to the US government and said, look, let's figure this out, let's work this out. But I can understand why big tech says, you know what, it's hard to work with these guys when you got someone like Lena Khan trying to, trying to kill you, so yeah. let's fight them. That's my, that's my rant, I always say, get the talented people that know tech. The other thing he said was, when asked about the, the AI, AI, intellectual property and AI, and I was trying to tease out whether he would go there on the IP with China, he said the challenge is, 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 is about not being entitled. We have to earn the position. Silicon Valley doesn't have it, nor does the U.S. You got to make it a sense of urgency to control our own destiny. They was leaning into that. Then he quoted some numbers. The last year, 12% um, uh, uh, of unicorn growth in the U.S. China only had three at 4%. India at 22%. So he was kind of using unicorns as a proxy for new venture development in these countries. So U.S. doing good, China not. India, the surprise dark horse on that is up, up and to the right. Um, so he's very bullish on India, so he's doing a lot of work he there. He did say a lot of the U.S. unicorns could be in trouble as well, right? Yeah, as we saw Dropbox you know, laying off, that's a Gen 1 cloud, cloud native SaaS company. The shining example of how to do a startup with cloud computing, a AKA AWS. So we're starting to see some kicks in the armor, Dave, around some of the growth. So, uh, and then I asked him about the connectivity, he said, infrastructure's people. <laughs> that, was, that, yeah. was, that was a good one, I like that one. Well, um, yeah. so his, his West Virginia comment, I brought up Joe Manchin, and of course, Joe Manchin's a Democrat, John Chambers, of course, brought in the Republican, you know, uh, Congresswoman <laughs> as well, and so he had to give that balanced approach. There you go. He thinks we should lead in defense of AI and cybersecurity has to move forward. He, you asked him about, should we pause AI? He's like, absolutely not. He was almost leaning in like violently, like saying, no way, he, should we stop, He ever. didn't say it, but it, he, he was basically, basically said, it's idiotic, yeah. I mean, those are my words. Yeah, he and he said, don't it. stop, go faster, that's it, my takeaway. It's, it, it's so dumb, I mean, how yeah. do you stop progress? I mean, you can't, and, and, but by the way, if you could, you would just be giving you know, other countries the leg up. Why would yeah. you do that? That makes no sense. He's well, right on on that. Great guest to have John Chambers on. We'll try to get some other guests. We'll get Andy Jassy, maybe try to get Amazon CEO to come on. That would be a, a coup. Yeah, well, we, get, we should do that. Yeah, let's, CEO let's of Cisco, it. let's get, we had the CEO of uh, Zscaler you know, on. It'd be good to get Pat Gelsinger. We got to get on. Pat, He's yeah. a big friend of the Cube over the years, so. If anyone has ideas there. watching and listening for guests, DM us. We're going to go try to get the best guests we can um, and hear what you want to hear. So Maybe we get Lena Khan and, and, and Andy Jassy on at the same time, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Lena, and the she, union representative yeah. from, the, from, the, from the workers. <laughs> well, Andy Jassy has a new shadow, that was news this week. Uh, um, he I has a new that. technical advisor, AKA the shadow, and that person that was selected has a lot of fulfillment background. It's not an AWS person, which I didn't think he'd need because he has full knowledge of that, but I think he picked someone who's technically proficient in fulfillment, logistics. Dave, interesting tell sign there for Jassy, who's going to pick his technical advisor, AKA right hand shadow, they call it, um, which he was, for, he was for Jeff Bezos. So a couple things, shadow. And, and maybe you could provide context on this, because you know Jassy better than I do, but he, he was, correct me if I'm wrong, he was essentially Bezos' shadow, right, as his chief of staff you know, in the early days, and when he came up with the notion, uh, he and I'm sure others came up with the notion of you know, Amazon Web Services, and under you know, Bezos directions, like, okay, go for it. So this is not a, you know, a throwaway position. This is a big no. deal at Amazon. Being a shadow is like heir apparent kind of opportunity. It's, it's Jezo, Bezos had Jassy as a shadow for years. That was basically your own tutelage under, the, under that person. It's a role for grooming, and also to see what their affinity is so they can move into the organization and be a leader. Yeah. It's almost like a growth strategy. It, it's a program to identify talent and that groom that talent so they can see what you see. And then they have more aperture into the business challenges. So, um, and usually it's also for the CEO or the person to lean into someone to be complimentary. So picking someone with fulfillment tells me that Jassy is thinking a lot about the logistics of Amazon now that he's the CEO of Amazon Inc. That's about retail, that's going to be about stores, that's going to be about physical infrastructure, and union, warehouses. So, studios. So, so I want to I want to say this is that we've written about this in the past is that I think that that you know when you think about the disruption potential disruption scenarios to Amazon I think one of the biggest is obviously the warehouses. So their biggest strength is that they had the ability to get the products in and get them out and distribute them really quickly. 
The problem is that infrastructure is very expensive. It's a huge part of their CapEx. And if you look at what, how Alibaba does it, it's they, they go direct. So what if, with generative AI, you were able to search for products and have those products directly shipped to you without having to yeah. go through the Amazon warehouses. Now we've built up all this trust for Amazon and great customer yeah. experience, but that to me is a big disruption scenario that, that Jassy has to deal with. Yeah, and I think and people like ask me all the time about Andy, and like we've worked with him, we've interviewed many times, we got to know him on a personal level. He's smart, and I think when you had, what they did with the pandemic on AWS and on Amazon Inc. when, when Bezos was the CEO before Jassy took over, is they, they moved the needle, they moved the ball down the field, they grew like hell. They were in perfect position to leverage all aspects of the pandemic. Getting deliveries at home, um, AWS Connect was a huge success, AWS grew, their partner network grew. So during the pandemic, Amazon grew like you read about. They were like unbelievable. So he's publicly been transparent. Hey, we overhired, and the pandemic's there, we're going to rein that in, and he's, just, he's getting in the weeds, and he's the kind of executive that's going to roll his sleeves up and get in the weeds and, and, and chop some stuff down. So I think he's pretty much in retooling mode right now. So if you look at what he's, the moves he's making, both on AWS side with Selevsky and what he's doing over there, it makes a lot of sense he's going to get a shadow that's going to be fulfilled Oriented because he has to, those are risk factors, big time in the business. So you've nailed that from day one with your assessment there, but you know, who knows with it, maybe they don't even have warehouses at all. Who knows? Right. Well, I think, I think so, but how do you unwind that, right? They've got a huge it's investment. It's a huge cost structure. Yeah, and, got so, it. and it's been their biggest advantage. Yeah. And it, you know, I'm most excited about what Jazzy's doing with Prime uh, Hollywood. They got a, a scathing write-up in the Hollywood Reporter last month, um, and it was like, well, Amazon doesn't work. But I think that's because Hollywood and Amazon. What was the criticism? I'm, I'm the culture of Amazon and Hollywood don't match. Hollywood's like, oh yeah, hey, you know, oh, yeah, let's yeah. do this. Amazon's, let's work backwards from the customer. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, how do you make a hit? <laughs> What's the outcome? Yeah, let's make a hit and then work backwards from that. You can't work backwards from a hit. You can do that with software, but you can't do it with art, you know, like. So, you know, Hollywood's like, what the fuck? Like, guys, that's not how we do it. And Amazon's like, no, that's how we do it. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a little bit of, a, you know, rubbing and uh, you know, some friction there, but I think Amazon will have a great position. They got the MGM, they got Prime, it's got great reach. The services are good. Every once in a while the technology kind of spins on me, which I don't like, but, but I think Prime, and they got the football, which is a great thing. I think they can get more into the sports. I, I think their, their Prime strategy is just genius. Well, I just I, think that's I, just And I amazing. think the future is bright for them. It's just, you, know, you just can't, you know, you got to reinvent yourself. Yeah. Jassy knows this. You can't just take your old model and bring it to the future yeah. if you're going to survive. And you know, you know the, the, the narrative in tech was, has always been, okay, it's crossing the chasm, it's the old guard, new guard, and things like that, but we've seen companies you know, kind of reinvent themselves. I mean, Microsoft is the best example, right? People had written off Microsoft, but they were able to live off their software margins and then reinvent themselves, and now they're be re, you know, reestablish themselves as a dominant player. You know, IBM, not, you know, not so much. They, they, they've struggled to, to have that, you know, the old cachet, but you know, nonetheless, they've sort of reinvented themselves as well a couple of times, and so, you know, I think it's the mark, John, of, of these companies, whereas, you know, Ch Chambers, was it Wang? Remember he, when you yeah. went to his house in Palo Alto? Yeah. You guys were talking about that. You know there is no entitlement, and so, you know, and so you got to work for that. But 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 it used to be the conventional wisdom was oh once you know DG Wang Prime you're dead right okay the mm -hmm. next next guard comes in, that's different now. I think I think leaders are a lot smarter, and the, the ecosystems can. Can thrive. Well, let's get into our rant section, get close out the podcast for the week. Obviously, we're here on location, Dave, at RSA. Um, great event, 45,000 people that I heard uh, on location. It's our first on podcast we've done on location, so in our beta mode, we're, I mean, we might have to do more of these on location given our, like our, this, our yeah. event schedule. Um, what's your rant for the week? Well, not surprising, I'm back on Lean Account. You saw that Microsoft uh, uh, was going to acquire Activision. Well, the the, the CMA, the UK Competition Markets Authority, uh, was reviewing it. We all thought they were going to say, okay, you can do the acquisition, but you just got to, these are the, the three or four conditions, and Microsoft and would have said, <clears throat> okay, fine, no problem. So, here's my rant. Um, I think this is misguided. I, I think this is a, a big mistake. They should allow the acquisition to go through. Yet again, it's, it's governments around the world, and I'll come back to Lena Khan, uh, basically, saying, hey, the potential is there for less competition. And they're saying that for, for every you know, large acquisition right now. Now here's the thing, here's my rant. Lena Khan's schedule, her calendar, is public, okay? I don't know if you know that. I did not know no, that, that's good so, trivia. Yeah, you can go online and look at Lena Khan's schedule. Was so, she golfing every day? 
No, she's busy as hell. I mean, this, <laughs> this, this gal, I, I criticize her a lot, but not for her work ethic. I mean, she she's works mailing her it ass in. off. Let's face it, she's mailing no, she it she works in. her ass off. On Tuesday, April 5th, 2023, at 11 a.m., she met, it was the FTC and the European, or the UK Competitions Market Authority, the CMA, tech sessions, cases, and investigations. Okay, so they met on April 5th. Now, I don't know what they talked about, but they absolutely are not supposed to be talking about an active investigation, and I'm not saying they did, but it's kind of strange that you know, they, they met, it's kind of curious that they met. My point is, here's the question. Is Lena Khan having the UK Competition Markets Authority do the, her dirty work for her? You guys kill it. That would be bad. Yeah, that would be bad. Now, I can't prove that, but I suspect it because I think Lena Khan doesn't care. I think she has, has been really aggressive going after big tech. I think she'll do anything to try to dismantle big tech and have outcomes that fit you know, her philosophy. I, I, I just, I find it really curious that they met on April 5th. I'd like to know what they talked about because I do think. Is it public record? I don't think it's public record what they talked about and they could deny that they talked about well, Activision. It's on the calendar. It's on the calendar that they met. I mean, are you telling me that it's Activision gotta be. didn't come up? Like, hey, why don't you guys <laughs> squeeze this? Look what happened with NVIDIA ARM. Okay, NVIDIA and ARM was killed before it even really got to the US and guess what? The US even sued NVIDIA over this and so it's like, the end game is it makes the U.S. less competitive. Why is that an outcome that the U.S. government wants? Because the, it's, to me, it's these unintended consequences, just like the breakup of AT&T made the U.S. <laughs> telecommunications system. Remember all the baby bells? Yeah. And what happened? They all got together again in their cable industries and they all get They ended up killing the last mile yeah. during the COVID days. Remember yeah, the, uh, and they created these big conglomerates, which is the same old, same old. So the U.S. government has a very poor track record of messing around with, with, with businesses in terms of large companies and antitrust and tech, at least, because I don't think they understand it. It moves too fast. Well, it's not clear what their doctrine is. I mean, Charles Fitzgerald, Fitzy, our buddy, put out a great post on this, and there's, a, there's certain philosophies of Fitzy's an, great. antitrust. <laughs> it's all, you're, the, big, the big guys become so big, we got to take them down just because they're too big. Um, yeah. So I don't think there's a lot of thinking. This is why, you know, there's a crossover. My rant is kind of like crossing over with yours, which is, because you're more, more on top of the Lena Khan thing, which I just dismiss her out of hand because I don't, I don't like her style. Too big to exist is her doctrine. I, I want more <laughs> qualified people around the table checking the calendar. I want more qualified people that know tech in making laws. I want more qualified people who know tech that understand the impact of society and, and the, the health of the human services that are need people in their, in their constituency. I want to see health care. I want to see better education. And I think our lawmakers and our government is uh, not aligned with how society works. And I think there's going to be a revolution. And again, AI, whether AI funds it or, you know, it's, there'll be a revolution, something coming quick because it's a tinder box right now of culture mismatch. Um, and it's just obvious. Cybersecurity here at this show, it's just, you know, my rant about the red line. The bad actors have been operating freely, causing destruction, misinformation, financial loss for years. And everybody knows it's a public secret, but nobody's doing anything. Right, they're just talking about it. So they are talking know, about it. You know, the public-private yeah. partnership. We we talked to Fortinet. We talked to Palo Alto and CrowdStrike. You're seeing pub nonprofits. They're not really astroturfers. They're the alignment. They're going out and trying to do more cyber protection. But clearly, the 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 whole doctrine of removing that that how we're being attacked has to go down because nation states are giving off-book organizations the weaponry cyber weaponry to attack us. And that's fact, and they get, well it's not us, but yeah, it's China, it's Russia, it trails it's back. Iran. I mean, it's basically state on state attacks. There's a discussion today in the keynote about um, an Iran attack, and they, it was a bunch of government folks, and they were asked, can we definitively say this was you know, the Iranian government? They, they said no, but we can say that it came out of Iran. Well, of course you know that the, yeah. the imams know about this. Right, so is it an, the question is, is it an act of war? Yes, it's yes, an act of war. I agree. If it someone drops troops war. out of a helicopter down a rope and goes and ransacks a house and ties up the victims and takes all their shit, yes, that's fucking, you, that's an attack. You, right. You, and the government this, will be like, hey, let's attack back. You made this analogy yesterday. Our right? doctrine in the, for liberty and freedom in the United States is if they cross the red line, we counter strike back at an epic proportion to, as a deterrent. Otherwise, we have to become a surveillance state like China 
And that's not what people want in America. They want liberty, they want freedom, right? That's key. So the red line has to move down. So if you, if you invade our bank's malware, Russia, we're going to just counter strike you back. And the, 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 that deterrent is, has to be there. But right? I think it's happening. Yeah, so that's I a do doctrine. Think that's that, is a, that is a government doctrine. I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not a political person, but that's common sense. And they're like, well, no one died, no one actually attacked us. Well, like, I don't think the government's think, saying that. I actually think the government is There's actually is an article that says if someone dies in an attack, that triggers an action militarily. Well, I, there's no military in cyber, really. There's, they tried CyberCom under Keith Alexander, so we don't have a cyber. Wait, if somebody doesn't die, it's not an act of war? You're not well, saying I mean, that. Well, I mean, I think, I'm not, I, I was on the New York Times before, she and I were debating about this, and she was pulling up this, like, apparently a trigger. If someone dies in an attack, a U.S. citizen, that triggers, so if someone gets, hostage and say Iran, they kill an American. That's not good, and that triggers escalation to militarily as a, as a doctrine policy. But I really do believe, I mean, I, <clears throat> I am sort of an optimist in this sense that, I, that the U.S. government is retaliating to these nation states. I hope they are, but I, I, I'm, I can I almost, see it. I can't guarantee it, but I'm very confident that they are doing it. Yeah, but it's so. not in the dialogue, and this is not in the lawmaking. Yeah, but so it again, shouldn't be in the dialogue. Well, right? if it's I covert mean, operations. It's, it's got to be covert. Well, well, Again, <laughs> we're a free country, it shouldn't be, this should be covert, and there should be known things that you let laws to make covert happen, not just covert for covert's sake. If you assume that they're attacking <laughs> our adversary, then, then but we I know, guess that's good, we but know, I don't go know back, about go, it. Go all the way back to Stuxnet. We know that it was the U.S. and Israel cavorting to create you know, havoc um, amongst the, you know, within the Iranian nuclear you know, infrastructure. We know that, they've never admitted it, Israel's never admitted it, the United States has never admitted it, and they shouldn't admit it. But keep doing it. <laughs> I see. I do believe the U.S. government is yeah. is doing. We that just need to it, have an intelligence organization and the, and laws or, and doctrine like formalized. But I don't think I've met people smart enough in government that know that. It's mostly military no, people. No, come on. Come on. No, no lawmakers. Come, come on. Which no, lawmakers right now are saying, "Hey, we want to write new laws." Lawmakers different. But the but, but there are people in the government with the CIA, the FBI, the NSA that are out protecting course, our but, citizens. Of course, but the lawmakers and, and but, doing a good job. I, no, of it. That, that I'm fine with. I know yeah. you can rally some people because they've been muted by the mainstream media, but I would say that as a lawmaker, look at the society saying, if this is hurting Americans, cyber war, then action needs to be taken. So the question is, is cyber war happening and what's the impact? Yes. Banks are being fleeced, misinformation, culture being forked. Who knows? So that's got to be investigated. So that's all I'm saying. I agree with you. So. All right, my rant's done, um, Dave. So, pod eight. We're on location. Nine, the cube. Events nine? are back. This is eight or nine? Nine. <laughs> this is nine, right? No, yeah, this is nine. nine. <laughs> Episode nine. Lost track. Sorry. Events are back. We'll do more on location podcasts like I this like if we this, can. I like this, This is good. Um, uh, it's more, more effective, we hear. And uh, give us feedback. If you're watching, let us know what you think. Listening, DM us what guests you'd like to see. Again, first 10 are kind of beta, get, get the format down. We got John Chambers this week, our first official guest on the podcast. He was good. And uh, we'll try to get bigger guests, so thanks for listening. And again, always ping us, siliconangle.com is our site. You can see a lot more coverage on security. Uh, we're amping that up big time. You're going to see more cl cloud coverage and uh, more enterprise and emerging tech. You're going to see more AI stories on siliconangle.com than any other publication combined, so stay tuned to that. If you're into AI, you know, check out Silicon Angle. We got startups covered, the deep dives, everything's happening there. So, again, next time we'll we'll hopefully have a, a great guest, Dave. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening. Thank you.